Welcome back inside the No Morning Show. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. I hope you got your coffee, you have your tea, and you're ready for your spotlight on now with Natalie. All right, great morning to you guys. It's just about 19 minutes after the hour of 6 o'clock. Thank you so much for choosing us here on the No Morning Show. And yesterday we spoke with uh, uh, Dr. Eric Williams' daughter, Erica Williams, about his book, Capitalism and Slavery. Now, Penguin has taken the decision to publish the book 80 years after it was written. And it has been getting a, some serious traction. But we just wanted to have a historical perspective on this book and why. Why, when it was written, nobody in England except one small publisher really wanted to publish it? And why the psyche of the Trinbagonian population don't really maybe appreciate or understand the importance of this book? So let's welcome to the program, retired senior lecturer, lecturer in the Department of History at UWE, Dr. Claudia, Claudius Fergus. Good morning to you, Dr. Fergus. Good morning. Uh, good morning to you, Natalie, and good morning to the viewers. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Happy New Year. It's never too late to say it. <laughs> same to you. Same to you. <laughs> thank this. you. Ooh, I hear that rooster in the background, man. Ensuring that you're up on time. Yes, 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 yes. It's right outside. So, Dr. Fergus, talk to us about this book, Capitalism and Slavery, because we saw where yesterday, not recently, Penguin took the decision to... To, to publish it, and according to the Guardian uh, UK, according to a Guardian UK article, is that there has been a serious, serious reaction to it, a positive reaction, that is, and that there's a pre-order of 1,400 books, you know, as a result of it, you know, being published again. But let us just go back a little bit. Matter of fact, before we even go back, how do you feel about the fact that it's back in circulation, at least at, on that scale, you know, in Britain? Well, Natalie, I, I think there are some errors in the Guardian publication that give the impression that the book was out of circulation for much longer than it actually was. Uh, I have two copies of the book, and uh, the latest that I have was published in 1981, which is the year that the book was purchased. And that was the fifth reprinting of the book since Andrew Dodge published it in 1964. You know, it was published in 67 and during the 70s. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was published after 81. But even if it was not, it meant that the book was in circulation for much longer than the impression given by the UK Guardian. In fact, they did correct some errors with a, a second edition online concerning uh, the original date of publication. So there are still some errors to correct. But nonetheless, I, it's the publication, the republication of the book by another publisher, uh, I think has to do a lot with the current atmosphere uh, created by the Black Lives Matter movement and other Black consciousness movement that, that have been forcing the former colonial uh, the former colonial um, powers, you know, those who colonized uh, Africa, uh, the Caribbean, and elsewhere, to rethink uh, their objectives in, in, in colonization, which they promoted as a civilizing mission, you know, to what it really was, you see, which were uh, campaigns of conquest and exploitation and genocide, and so on, so that uh, it's a reawakening, really, you know, for example, they have been forced to to admit, Britain particularly have been forced to admit, you know, uh, genocide in Kenya and uh, to pay reparations. They have been forced, uh, Britain and other nations, to return stolen artifacts, you know, from Africa and so on, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it's a new atmosphere that has been created. I think it started uh, somewhere around the preparation for the the bicentennial for the abolition of the British slave trade around 1807, you know. So for that bicentennial, a lot of people were waking up to the atrociousness that colonialism really was. And this is all part of that ongoing movement. 
Uh, and you know what? It's funny you say that because we know that right here in the Caribbean we have a committee for reparations and restitution, and we don't. I don't think we've seen the same kind of response from Britain towards the Caribbean in terms of just accepting in the first instance, you know, what was done over the years and, and, and how we were treated as a people. Is the republication of this book by Penguin going to make a difference to that? I don't think at the official level, no. Remember, we are talking about the academic level here. Uh, we are not talking about the British government's response. I don't think that was even hinted at in the Guardian piece. We are talking about, you know, activists. A number of them were mentioned, scholars, lecturers, and so on. And that is the level where the impact of the book would be felt most. I don't think it's going to affect the government's attitude towards um, colonialism because once they admit uh, to the guilt of colonialism and uh, that they, in fact, committed crimes against humanity, uh, which actually they had admitted during the debate for the abolition of slave trade that the trafficking in Africans was a crime against humanity. But apparently they are backpedaled and they're not going to do that because that would mean in the present um, context, uh, reparations, paying reparations, and I don't think they intend to do that unless they're really forced to do it through perhaps some international court. And even from back then when this book was written, we saw a similar kind of response from the British government in that nobody really wanted to print the book thinking that it was a slap in the face of Britain. Talk to us about that a little bit and, you know, why this book, Capitalism and Slavery, was such an affront to the British powers. Well, it was an affront to the British power, but I don't think the British government directly had a hand in not publishing. Publishers took positions that were uh, in sync with the goals and objectives of empire so that they did not print the book because it would have undermined the narrative of Britain as a moral empire. Uh, remember, this was still the height of um, uh, empire, well, at the tail end of empire, because the empire collapsed just after the war, a few years after the book was published. But nonetheless, it was the, the foundation of empire was also based on the false narrative that colonialism was a civilizing mission. And so that narrative, which had been established since the abolition of the slave trade, you know, by Thomas Clarkson's book, The History of Abolition, had been revived during the conquest and colonization of Africa. And so you find that there were new works coming into being. And, uh, and just around that time, climaxing with works like by uh, authors by Frank Klingsberg and, and Reginald Copeland. Uh, who faced the brunt of, of, of Williams' attack in the book. You know, Will, uh, Copeland was particularly targeted by Williams for promoting this false narrative. So that it was a time when Britain needed this, this, this sort of intellectual propaganda in order to support the conquest and colonization of Africa. There was no way they were going, they, they were going to accept that kind of, 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 of book that challenged that narrative. So it's understandable why they would have objected to it. Uh, America objected to a lot of books too, although the book was published in America, in the United States. Uh, the United States was just building up its own empire out of World War II. And so, you know, accepting this book to publish it would have been a sort of counter narrative to Britain as the moral empire. So Brit um, United States was now emerging, you know, as the new, um, the, the, the new um, superpower in, in, in terms of global politics. And so um, putting a shadow on British uh, imperialism would not have done them any harm at all. In fact, it would have helped to promote their own image yeah. of America as the new uh, superpower that was bringing a new kind of democracy and, and freedom to the world. And did that position influence how uh, Trinbagonians responded or were able to access the book? Well, you see, uh, Trinidad and Tobago was a colony of Britain. Auricula was therefore the British 
curricula operating at all the school levels. There was no university at the time. Uh, the University College of the West Indies was established in 1948. And that was, you can see, an off campus of London University. So that until 1962, when we had our own university being established, and, um, and when history was introduced, because there was no teaching of history in the UCWI, it was just, uh, you can say, a faculty of medicine. There was no history teaching at the university until the 1960s. So that students at the university were only uh, exposed to that book from the 1960s. But then again, the first lecturers that uh, shaped the, 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 the history courses in the campuses in Trinidad, in, in Mona, Jamaica, and, and later in Barbados, would have been schooled in the British universities, mainly Oxford and Cambridge, and they were not very much uh, enthusiastic about uh, advancing that book. It was not until Professor Selwyn Carrington came to the UWI St. Augustine campus that capitalism and slavery was projected, you know, onto the students as a main text. In fact, Carrington created a, a new course called Capitalism and Slavery, which is still being taught at, 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 the, at, at least in our campus here. I'm not sure the other campuses still, you know. So that that book, which is a scholarly work, is not a book for popular reading, you know, would be exposed to upper secondary school, sixth form students and university students. And I think that every student that did history, and we know history is not a popular subject, so a lot of, we are talking about, first of all, a minority of students across the country who would be doing history. And then because you are selecting courses to do, who would be selecting a course called Capitalism and Slavery? Uh, the West Indian history courses also would have addressed um, the book as a main book in terms of the decline thesis, as they call it, you know, that's the main book. Uh, but only after the second generation of historians would have taken over from the founders of the history courses at the UWE. So that's the main reason behind, you know, the, the low... Um, perhaps the, I wouldn't say lack of knowledge, you know, um, the, the lack of popularity of the book, because so few people do history in Trinidad and Tobago. And it is a book that you would find mainly among sixth form students as the history students. But, but Dr. Fergus, do you believe that with this whole, you know, black consciousness with the Black Lives Matter movement, that this is something that should be put back on the cards in Trinidad and Tobago, should be included more in the curriculum, will it even make a difference? It is already in the syllabus of schools in, in, in across the Caribbean, because now that we have local examinations, and that's another thing, you had um, the, the GCE, which is, was an English-based curriculum, you would not have expected them to promote the book either. So it is only with CXC that you find that the book is now recommended reading. But as I said, it's for sixth form and the university. I do not think it would be introduced to lower forms. I don't think, I'm not saying it shouldn't be, but at that level, it would be mainly a resource text for, for teachers. I don't expect lower form students to be reading the book. Right. All right, so we do have to leave it there, but any final comments before we go? No, well, I think it's a great thing that the book is being republished. It's, 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 it's bringing, uh, again, new attention to the book. But among the scholarly community, the book is also well known. There was a 50th anniversary of the publication of that book in Trinidad and Tobago in 1994. Again, Selwyn Carrington and uh, Erica, um, Erica Williams, as she was known then, were the main orchestrators of that conference. It was a global conference. You know, I was there and uh, a lot of the top-notch people, those who criticized the book also had to promote it. Don't forget that. There are a lot of, you know, the imperialist scholars criticize the book, but by criticizing it, they have to study it and they have to bring it to their students. 
you know. So the book is pretty well known, and it is a good thing now that Penguin, which is a producer of popular books, is publishing the book, and perhaps it would now be, you know, more common among, you know, activists in particular, you know, in yeah. England, so they would understand, you know, what they are up against. You know, it's 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 it's, it's a momentous uh, occasion for for publishing for uh, yeah. the publication of the book. Well, as you said, it might be known in the scholarly circles, but let's hope with its republication that even the, the British government might have a look and see if they could learn a thing or two. Well, Natalie, people like you would have to promote the book. Eh? It's media, you know, um, traditional media like this one, social media and so on, will have to promote the book also, not just the publishing of the book. Yeah, well, that's why we're having this conversation. So hopefully we've done our part. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're most welcome, Dr. Claudius Fergus, there, a retired senior lecturer at the Department of UA, talking to us about Dr. Eric Williams' book, Capitalism and Slavery, that, as he said, publishers at the time just did not want to go against the narrative of the British government mm -hmm. that, you know what, slavery, they ended slavery because, you know, uh, they were human, it, it was on humanitarian grounds and not because it was no longer economically viable. But you can find the book on uh, Amazon. Of, of course, it's that Metropolitan uh, Bookstore here in Trinidad and Tobago. And have a read. But we're going to go to a break and we'll be back with so much more.